So um, uh, we're fortunate. So we have a, we have a, a dissertation student in the history department who's a Latin Americanist right now, but in a previous incarnation was a Russianist and still is in some regards. Um, it's uh, Tony Wood. Tony Wood has a BA from Cambridge. He got his MA in Russian Studies at the School of Slavonic and East European Studies, aka CIS. Um, he did very little in between. He, he was a deputy editor of the New Left, of the, um, New Left Review. Uh, he's written about two dozen articles. Is that about right? Have you counted? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was kind of embarrassed for the rest of us as I was reading it. Um, again, for lack of time, wrote two books. I just want to this is the um, He writes clearly. Uh, he writes intelligently, uh, meaning everything that an academic would like to be but fails to do. And, uh, <laughs> uh, in fact, I wonder why you're doing a dissertation. <laughs> you're doing fine, right? Um, um, and so his most recent book, the first one, by the way, was on Chechnya, which makes the case for the independence or sovereignty of Chechnya. Uh, the current book that we're discussing today came out also with Verso. The first one was Verso, wasn't it? Um, also with Verso, and um, it's on the topic of Putin. And the, um, uh, how best to put it, the personality cult around Putin is developed in the West but not in Russia. Would that be a good way to put it? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, and how it is that uh, this, uh, this extreme pathological focus on Putin has distracted us from many other things we could be talking about. Yeah? Right. Uh, now, to do this, we have uh, two commentators, I'm a just commentator at large. Uh, but we start off with Tony giving a few words about the books, so that most people have not read it, not seen it, so it's take some time to explain what the argument is. Uh, I was personally interested in how you researched it, it's, it's not obvious because it's, it's not footnoted right, in, the, in the way we usually, you know what I mean, the dense, you know, and stuff like that, and, and, and I know that it has been researched, so um, I, I'd be curious to hear about that. But, but go ahead. Okay. Um, so thanks very much uh, for that introduction, Yanni, and thank you all for coming. And uh, thanks also to the Jordan Center for hosting the event. I know everyone has a lot of demands on their time at this uh, point in the year, so I'm glad you could all make it. Um, I don't want to spend too long uh, soliloquizing, but as Yanni said, it would be worth saying a bit about the uh, the main arguments of the book, and I will say a little bit about the process of writing the book, in case anyone's interested in that. Um, but first of all, I guess I should say a little bit about the origins of the book, um, because um, well, I think it uh, might be relevant and interesting. Uh, in a way, this has sort of two origins, this book. I started thinking about writing this book in around 2011-12, when the protests uh, against, well, initially against electoral fraud and then against Putin's inevitable return to the presidency uh, were unfolding in sort of late 2011, early 2012. Um, partly because there was a lot of emphasis at the time on this uh, moment as a kind of... Uh, political emergence of a so-called new middle class. Uh, this was you know, rife in the financial press, the pace of The Economist, The Guardian. Uh, everyone seemed to be taking up this trope of this new middle class that had supposedly emerged in the 2000s in Russia and was now you know, voicing its uh, liberal opinions. Um, and obviously there was a great deal about this that seemed oversimplified and wrong, but also I realized that um, I certainly didn't have a particularly clear picture of if this was a middle class, what was it the middle of, right? What is this social structure that has emerged from the collapse of the USSR? What has happened to the different social classes, social layers? Uh, you know, what is the class landscape of post-Soviet Russia? So that was the first question that I began with uh, in this book. Um, and really as an answer to, you know, trying to undo that myth of the new middle class. But obviously uh, it was taking me some time to write this book and uh, in the meantime a few other things happened. Uh, notably the Ukraine crisis, uh, the annexation of Crimea, and the sort of total massive downslide in uh, relations between Russia and the West that's happened uh, in the past four years. Um, and I realized at that point that even though I still make in the book a number of arguments about the post-Soviet social structure, um, it had to be a quite different kind of book because the whole climate around Russia, the kind of the context of debate into which you are publishing is very different uh, now from what it was in 2011-2012. So, um, so the dual origin of the book really is reflected in the title, which uh, as many of you in the room will know, this was the slogan of the 2011-12 protest, Russia against Putin. Um, and, and I picked it up and I used it in a different sense. I don't mean it in, as, a, as a political slogan. Uh, I have no uh, influence on how Russian polit politics unfolds. And I certainly don't mean it as a call for regime change coming from uh, this side of the Atlantic. Uh, what I really mean it as is a, as an analytical premise. Um, so 
really the, the, the first sort of initial thesis of the book, as Yanni described, is that I want to undo the excessive emphasis on Vladimir Putin, his personality, his character, as a way of understanding and explaining the entirety of Russia, its political systems, its actions on the world stage, its society. Um, the, what I try and describe in the book is initially is how that excessive focus on one man is, um, it has this very narrowing effect on discourse, but also it's, it's very um, counterproductive in that if every single news story about Russia has to feature Putin in some way, then there's very little way of making sense of Russia without reference to Putin. So it's sort of this self-confirming loop that narrows the frame of reference. Um, so I think we've now got into, I think, a paradoxical situation where Russia is much less well understood by the Western public at large than the Soviet Union was at the height of the Cold War. I, mean, I could be wrong about that, but my sense of the, the level of knowledge, uh, the degree of sort of information that people have available is, is greatly inferior um, in terms of quantity and also quality. Um, what I then go on to do in the book, after having laid out that argument that you know, the focus on Putin is excessive, um, I think really then once you start to think about uh, what distorting effects that has, uh, you need to start asking a different series of questions. And so, uh, in the first chapter of the book, what I effectively do is try and describe Putin's career and his emergence, but as a, a product of and an expression of an emerging post-Soviet system. This is one of the key sort of recurrent myths about Putin that is in, certainly in the West, is that he is a product of the Soviet era, all of his inclinations and his policies are shaped by a desire to somehow restore the Soviet Union. And I, I mean, obviously he was shaped by his Soviet experiences, I'm not going to deny that, but I think actually uh, his career as a political figure and everything distinctive about him as a politician is much more a product of the post-Soviet era of the Yeltsin years and of the, te the close intertwined relationship between uh, money, power, and even organized crime, corruption, all of these things. So a lot of those distinctive Putin features are, are post-Soviet rather than Soviet. Um, but the other key uh, aspect of that is that you really have to see him as a product of a system. Um, so even though the personality of Putin is very important and his character has shaped uh, the Russian state system over the past 20 years, uh, it's really uh, it, that the personality question really distracts it from what this is as a system. Uh, and once you're looking at a system, I think, again, as I was saying, you need to pose a different series of questions. Um, so what I then do in the book is look at different aspects of contemporary Russia seen as a system rather than through the lens of personalities. Um, so I'm just going to sort of enumerate, I guess, well, six because there are six chapters. But um, one of these concerns the political system. Um, there are a number of different labels that have been applied to uh, contemporary Russia. There's, uh, I think one of my favorites is competitive authoritarianism. Uh, there's managed democracy, which is one of the regime's own ideal ones produced. Uh, the term I prefer, um, I borrow from the Russian political science scientist uh, Dmitry Fordman, which is imitation democracy. Um, and what he means by that is a system that is democratic in form, that requires elections to be held in order for, uh, in order for its rule to be legitimated. Um, but it's also a system in which the opposition cannot be permitted to come to power. So there is a fundamental breach, if you like, between the ideological form of the regime and its actual practical workings. Um, and the reason for that breach, um, and again, this is Fordman's analysis that I'm picking up, is that all of these post-Soviet regimes are fundamentally committed to a program of capitalist transformation, for which they do not have a democratic mandate. Right? So once you've got those two variables, that capitalist transformation no democratic mandate, I think a lot more becomes clear about the nature of the post-Soviet system. Um, crucially, I guess the second feature of the, the system that I would emphasize, in addition to that breach, um, I try and undo in the book this idea of a break between the 1990s, the Yeltsin era, and the 2000s. Again, you know, a lot of you in this room will be very familiar with the tropes that are used in this discourse. You know, the Yeltsin era was sort of chaotic, but democratic. It was a period of free market openness and transformation, and obviously, yes, there were some crooked things happening, and it was a bit messy. But on the whole, it was a positive, you know, transformative, liberatory period. And I think people in Russia certainly don't see it that way. Uh, number one, but number two, I think 
there's a lot more continuity between that phase of, uh, if you like, creative destruction of the old system uh, and the Putin uh, system that emerged in the 2000s. So, uh, I mean, I don't want to go into this too long because it will uh, take a long time, but essentially what I try and describe in the book is the relationship between these two phases, uh, not as totally distinct epochs politically, but as uh, successive phases in the evolution of one system which, again, I call imitation democratic, borrowing that terminology. Um, yeah, and again, I'll be happy to come back to this in the discussion afterwards, uh, this is all seeming a bit too brief. Um, so that's the political system, um, but with, as has just been described, a strong economic component, this idea of capitalist transformation being the core guiding purpose of the regime. Um, and that leads us into the question of what kind of economy Russia has, what is this sort of economic structure, if you like, and again, this is where I try and undo a lot of the tropes of Western analysis that somehow under Putin, Russia has reverted to a kind of state capitalism or, you know, uh, something like socialism or, you know, at, at least some kind of dirigiste uh, uh, strategy or at minimum some kind of crony capitalism. Um, and again, what I describe in the book is really that actually what Russia has is the form capitalism itself took in post-Soviet conditions. Um, and there's a, there's a really close entwinement between political power and economic wealth in Russia, and that's been true from the outset. So the, the contrast between the 90s and the 2000s, again, they're not fundamental contrasts uh, in the nature of the system. They're to do with the, the relative weight and influence of different parts of this elite. Um, and I go into more detail about uh, the 1990s oligarchs who made their fortunes in a particular set of circumstances and a particular set of sectors, and the ones from the 2000s. But I see them as, as again, different factions of the same elite rather than a fundamentally different kind of uh, social and political actor. Um, so yeah, the third chapter is about what kind of society Russia has. Um, and again, in this one, I'm trying to undo a different myth, uh, which is this idea that whatever is wrong with Russia is a product of uh, Soviet legacies, that these are somehow weighing down on Russia, uh, and the sooner Russia is free of the burden of the Soviet past, the sooner it can join the uh, community of normal, quote marks, countries. Um, and I actually have a, a, a somewhat perverse thesis, and I turn this on its head, that actually um, the legacies of the Soviet past are precisely what has enabled capitalism to be established and consolidated in Russia. This comes out of this question of why Russia is so, given all of the turmoil that it experienced in the 90s, why, is it, why was it so stable compared to other countries where, you know, I mean, you see right now in France, you know, these uh, economic austerities producing you know, street demonstrations across the nation, uh, and Russia, a much more profound economic crisis, much more profound suffering over a period of many years, produced nothing like this. Uh, and a lot of the explanations for this hinge on you know, cultural explanations, apathy, or some uh, sense of desperation. But I think actually the fact that some of the infrastructure, the physical infrastructure, but also the social infrastructure and the social attitudes from the Soviet period were carried over, uh, in a way provided a kind of subsidy to the new order. Um, the clearest example I can think of this, and I, again, I'll try and do this quickly because I know I'm uh, speaking at length, which I said I wouldn't do. Um, but uh, one is um, the, the trade unions. Um, in the Soviet period, essentially, trade unions were effectively a branch of management. I mean, their goal, their, their purpose was really to facilitate produ uh, production, right? And so they had a number of functions within a given enterprise, but they were not designed to represent the interests of workers as against those of management, right? They were, they were differently something else. Uh, what happened in the post-Soviet period is that these trade unions, uh, you know, they were renamed, reconstituted organizationally, but essentially they carried on. Um, and in the 90s, industrial production is obviously collapsing, people are losing jobs, factories are being shuttered, as everyone probably knows. Um, and so these trade unions, their main goal was to preserve people's employment. And in this context of crisis, what they did was really work arm in arm with management to preserve people's jobs. Um, so rather than having a process where these unions disappeared, what you had is a continuity between the Soviet structures and the new ones, 
But what that also meant is that there is no combative or very little combative trade unionism in Russia in the 1990s. And ironically, you start to have that emerge in the 2000s in factories established by Western companies such as Ford, Volkswagen, all of these Western car manufacturers set up factories. And of course, because these are new installations, you have a new factory trade union, which in this case were independent trade unions. And these were much more militant. So in 2007, I think, you get, um, I think I'm right in saying, but I, someone could correct me on this, it's the first strike in a long time in Russia that is, uh, how to put it, an offensive strike, as in a strike for an increase in wages rather than to defend existing wages or existing benefits. It's actually seeing that profits are rising and workers saying, we deserve a piece of this profit. Um, and I think it's not an accident that that happens in a new capitalist plant rather than in any of the old Soviet ones. So, um, so that's just one particularly kind of concrete illustration of this sort of continuity of Soviet infrastructure and institutions acting as a kind of stabilizer during the 1990s and enabling this new capitalist system to be built and consolidated. Um, the analysis of uh, Russian society that flows from that, I think, is I have this, uh, borrow the term, of uh, combined and uneven social development, essentially, because what you have is this parallel existence of the old and the new. Right? And this applies uh, in terms of uh, physical infrastructure, in terms of uh, social institutions, but also in terms of people's mindsets. I think it's actually quite important that people uh, simultaneously can, can ascribe to a Soviet identity of one kind in terms of their place in the world, their, their, their location in the class hierarchy, but also they can interpret their place in terms of a new one, the new emergent market uh, order. This is especially important because people in the 90s certainly are often working two or three jobs. So they will retain their old factory job, which puts them in one place socially in the Soviet system, but also they'll be moonlighting as an, you know, selling whatever it is, vitamins or encyclopedias or driving a cab. And at that point, that's a market niche and it, it's a totally new social experience. But this is one person combining both of these. So I think that sort of confusion of, of social systems is, explains a lot of the confusion more broadly that's obtaining in Russia in the 90s and 2000s, I think. Um, some of that confusion, I think, uh, this sort of brings me into a chapter I put in the book about the nature of, this, of the Russian opposition. Because uh, the great question is, uh, as I alluded to earlier, why is there not more opposition? Why is this regime uh, so stable? Uh, why was there not more opposition in the 90s, more social discontent, and why is there not more opposition now? Um, and a lot of this, I think, has to do with this social confusion, this sort of sociological kind of muddling of identities and, and capacities for mobilization. Um, but some of it is also more narrowly political in the sense of uh, the existing opposition is a kind of un, ungainly mix, if you like, of, on the one hand, uh, largely urban based political parties who are predominantly liberal in ideology, and a much broader but diverse sort of fragmentary set of social movements who are mobilized around different issues, housing, education, uh, hospital reform, you know, healthcare, uh, environmental issues as well. Um, these are very sort of diverse sort of heteroclite groups um, with the predominantly social agenda, if you like, that for the most part, the liberal political movements and parties have not shown that much interest in until relatively recently. Um, so the period of which I'm addressing in the book, certainly there has been this, this rift between the, the political opposition, if you like, and the larger social movement, social opposition. And there, there hasn't really been an agenda to put these two components together. Um, the classic example of this, I think, is the, um, again, the 2011-12 protests where um, uh, which were the main figures in that were often sort of figures from the liberal intelligentsia and of course Alexei Navalny, the anti-corruption uh, activist. Uh, but there was no, the, the platform that emerged from those protests such as it was, was a demand for clean elections. So just rerun these elections. It was very intra-systemic, if you like. There was no sense that we need some project of broader transformation. And I think that is what is required. And, it's a big ask, but that is ultimately why there is this sort of gap between the potential for discontent uh, and the actual political, political expression of it. 
Um, cool. Penultimate chapters, I guess. Uh, the penultimate chapter is really, I, I go for that. Up to, until this point, I've really been analyzing Russia internally, uh, predominantly looking at what's going on uh, within Russia's borders. And in, in the fifth chapter, I look at foreign policy and what's going on outside. Uh, having established what kind of political system it has, an economy, and what sort of society it is, I think then you have a much more firm basis for trying to decide or explore what kind of actor Russia is on the global stage. Um, and in that particular chapter, obviously, I'm addressing uh, a very persistent and well-entrenched set of myths uh, in the Western media about Russia as a, as a global aggressor with sort of malevolent designs against Western civilization and democracy. Um, and really what I try and do in that chapter is, is contextualize uh, and gauge the relative weight of Russia and its actual influence on any of these questions. Um, and again, this is not to say that I approve any of Russia's actions on the world stage, I hope that should go without saying, but I think the degree of its actual power, but also the degree of coherence of its strategy has been massively overstated. Um, and really what I try and do in that chapter is to describe how much the environment in which Russia is making policy is shaped by much stronger powers in the West, Europe, NATO, and by much stronger forces, uh, economically speaking. And militarily. I mean, my favorite statistic, which again I'm sure most people here will be familiar with, is um, when Putin took power in 1999, he gave this speech saying uh, that with a bit of effort and good luck, within 15 years Russia could have the same GDP per capita as Portugal. Uh, which doesn't seem very ambitious, but of course, you know, they, they did pretty well with oil prices, things went pretty well, and they did reach that level of GDP per capita of Portugal in 2011. And they overtook Greece. And they overtook Greece. Uh, but the irony thing, of course, is that by 2011, in the midst of the Eurozone crisis, things are not going well for Portugal. There's something like, what, 40% youth unemployment. <laughs> by that point, Portugal's GDP per capita is one and a half times that of Russia. So imagine that you know one of the poorer countries of Western Europe in the depths of a crisis is still one and a half times richer than, Europe, than Russia on a per capita basis. Um, so I think you know those kind of statistics and just relative measurement of the strength of Russia are actually largely missing from the discourse, and I think they really matter. Um, and then in the last chapter I try and open out, it becomes somewhat more speculative, speculative uh, necessarily, because I sort of think about where is Russia going, right? What are the options it actually has, given that global context, uh, which is shaped by actors more powerful than Russia? Uh, what can it do? What kind of power is it going to be? Uh, what's its role? Um, and, you know, obviously it's a bit difficult to make any firm judgments on that. Um, but I think that the predominant feature of it really is this awkward intermediate status of being you know, a former superpower with a great deal of uh, weaponry, but also uh, a certain amount of ambition and expectation on the world stage, but with much reduced means. Uh, and so there's a fundamental gap between ambitions, habits, and expectations in Russia that is quite painful. As someone from Britain, I'm well aware of what that <laughs> post-imperial <laughs> pain is like for a lot of people. Um, and that, so necessarily the room for maneuver is very limited uh, for Russia. And I go in a bit more into some of the other internal transformations that will be happening demographically, very importantly, in terms of migration and the relative weights of the ethnic Russian and non-ethnic Russian populations and what that means for its federal system the national question rearing its head again, potentially. Uh, so there's a lot of interesting sort of things to, to think about there. And I, you know, I venture a few sort of speculative ideas, but I'm sure people will have uh, different things to say when they get to that point in the book. Um, and those are sort of larger arguments, I think, that you need to be having in the head. Um, so that's it for the kind of, for the main theses and arguments of the book. I mean, I don't know if that was clear, but certainly I can expand more and I'll go back and forth with uh, any points people would like to raise. Um, in terms of the process of writing the book, uh, I would say just sort of three or four things essentially really might. Uh, I mean, it's, as, as Yanni mentioned, it's not an academic book. It's not sort of heavily noted in the way that uh, academic books are, but I hope it is a scholarly book. It, has, uh, it, has, it does have footnotes and it has uh, a sort of uh, I try and have a sort of clear, I try and make clear what the foundations for any of my assertions are, so these could be argued with and checked. Um, really, it's, it's, 
I should also say that in terms of genre, it's really a work of synthesis uh, and analysis rather than a work of uh, reportage, for example. Um, so there's not much by way of uh, voices of ordinary Russians is really not trying to be that kind of book, uh, because I think that's the wrong kind of uh, level of magnification for the, try and for the kinds of argument I want to make. I, I felt that wouldn't quite work for me. Um, so because it is that kind of work of synthesis, uh, it's really dependent on doing a tremendous amount of reading of other people's work uh, and processing it and taking from a variety of different fields and disciplines wherever possible, which raises two problems, I think, which I've had to deal with. One is that it just takes a phenomenal amount of time. Um, <laughs> uh, and secondly is a more uh, methodological problem in a way that if you're borrowing from a lot of different disciplines and fields uh, and approaches, you have to be aware of what else is coming with that. You can't sort of empirically sort of cherry pick whatever details you want, you have to see what arguments are aligned behind those uh, apparent facts. Uh, so there's a necessary process of uh, reconciling points of view and, and almost every fact you take you also have to argue with it. So again, that, that slows you down somewhat. But I like to think that it is sort of enriching in itself. Um, I think the final thing I'd say about the press of writing I do, um, and again this probably not a point that needs making to this audience, but I will make it at other events I speak at, which is that it's really important to read materials in Russian, written by Russians in the Russian academic system, in the journalistic community, uh, whatever it is, but that uh, they will just not have the same analytical or political starting points as Western analysis, and that is absolutely crucial uh, to having a proper analysis of place, and again, this really shouldn't be insane, but that, in a way also, I think that the gaps between how Western knowledge is produced and laid out about Russia and how Russian knowledge about the country itself is produced uh, and circulated, in a way, those gaps are also part of the analysis, right? They have to be part of your argument, because if they're so uh, irreconcilably different, there has to be an explanation for that, too. Um, yeah, so I think that's, that's more or less all I have to say for now. And then Tony, you were also there for, for long periods of time, right? Yes, yeah. Uh, so when was I there? Well, I, ooh, I made my first trip in 1993. Uh, happy days. Yes, happy days, yeah. <laughs> it was quite a bizarre time. Um, I think the longest fellow I've been there was, uh, I guess, 10 months in 97 to 98. Uh, and then since then, I've been for a few weeks at a time. Uh, this summer, I was there for three months doing archival research uh, for my PhD. But, uh, so I was actually there for the um, pension protests that happened this summer, uh, which are not in the book, unfortunately. But I have written an article about that, which will be out at some point. Where? So, uh, in the London Review of Books. Well, thank you. Well, we have uh, two commentators. Um, would you like to go first? Maybe also sure. introduce yourself mm -hmm. and your angle on all of this? Um, yes, I'm Sophie Pinkham. I'm also doing a dissertation, although mine is in Slavic languages and literature, and it's at Columbia and not at NYU. Um, but I also have written um, nonfiction, non academic nonfiction. Um, my book, Black Square, The Adventures of the Soviet Ukraine, came out a couple of years ago. Um, so, first of all, I have much admiration for this book that Tony has written. I was looking forward to it for a long time, and I think that you have done. Uh, such a great job of very swiftly and succinctly and elegantly kind of dismantling a huge number of myths about the development of post-Soviet Russia that have come to totally dominate, uh, especially American, but also I think generally Western European discourse about Russia and that I think have really impeded um, our ability to understand what's going on there and to uh, sort of formulate reasonable policies and reactions um, to Russia. Um, I also really um, sort of broadly appreciated your methodology, I guess, um, and your dismantlement specifically of this, of this sort of cult of Putin from a Western perspective. I mean, there are, it seems, an infinite number at this point of books about 
Putin's biography, Putin's psychology, what does Putin think, how did Putin's childhood traumas make him so evil, uh, you know, Putin is from the KGB and that explains everything about Russia, Russia's development today. Um, so I think it's so important to sort of take, uh, take away this element of cultural personality of Putin um, and to really look at the sort of larger structural, historical, economic factors. Um, and it occurs to me also that um, this kind of more long, you know, relatively long-term kind of structural critique that insists on removing the reviled leader from the center of analysis and the center of explanation um, could also be very useful and fruitful at this moment in American politics. <laughs> um, so I had, let's see, um, and another thing I thought was really valuable in relation to Putin was, at one point you used the excellent phrase, um, Putin's ideological weightlessness. Um, and I think that, you know, there's often this idea that, you know, Putin is from the KGB and therefore he's trying to impose this Soviet ethos. Um, there's increasingly an idea that Putin is sort of a rabid ethno-nationalist um, who's trying to return to, you know, various schools of, um, of, of Russian ethnic nationalism. Um, and I would be interested in, in hearing you speak more about um, about this idea of Putin's sort of ideological weightlessness or his ability to sort of play to many different audiences and sort of from a structural perspective, how you would map out those audiences. Um, and then I guess the other thing I would be interested to hear more about was, um, I was very interested in this idea of, for, I mean, first of all, obviously of the continuity rather than um, the disjunction of the Yeltsin and Putin periods, um, the idea of Putin as the heir to Yeltsin, and also the, the idea of the Yeltsin era as the time of sort of the, or the heyday of sort of outsider oligarch versus um, the Putin era as the time of sort of insider oligarchs. Um, and I'd also be interested in hearing you talk, just talk more generally about the class of oligarchs and sort of whether it's even relevant really to speak about oligarchs as it stands in Russia today. Thank you. So I'm Elliot Borenstein, I'm a professor in Russian Islamic Studies. Um, I have a book coming out called Plots Against Russia, Conspiracy and Fantasy After Socialism, and I finished my dissertation. <laughs> um, so um, I want to chime in and share really everything, um, every positive word you said about this book, which is really also just a very good read. Um, thank you for not writing Timothy Snyder's book, um, <laughs> um, which I always have to read. Um, That's a well <laughs> um, So, but I do want to, even though I agree in the broad strokes with a lot of what you're saying, I want to push at a few of the, um, uh, few of the edges of it. Um, in terms of the continuity between the 90s and the post 90s, I think um, as a, almost as a rhetorical move, I think this is a very good thing to do. But as a substantive move, I, I do see a little bit of um, shakiness on the times. I think the, the continuity is actually more political than it is economic. That is, um, the notion of the 90s was a great time for democracy works in the sense of, of um, the emphasis on decentralization, which certainly is very is gone um, after the 1990s. Um, but you know, the 1996 presidential election was stolen, um, quite clearly stolen, and, and we were all happy about that. Um, I was happy about that at the time. Um, so there, there's plenty of manipulation going on, but in terms of of of, um, of, of the relationship between economic and political power, um, there I think there's a there's a big difference. I mean, the people who became the oligarchs in the 1990s. I mean, I'm reading uh, that book, Rich Russians Now, by Elizabeth Schumer. I can I can never remember the name, but it's a wonderful book. And she interviews people asking them, you know, why you think you got wealthy and um, many of them say, you know, because my genes are better, because I'm smarter and all that. And only a few of them actually mention what I think is the obvious uh, point, which is luck. Um, granted, you have to have some, some capabilities, but there was a kind of musical chairs thing that went, went on, right? You know, private education happens, and oh, I'm sitting here with this factory, and I kind of got it, and I also have the cap capabilities to take advantage of this. So you have people getting wealth kind of through bureaucratic connection slash luck slash slyness, and what they get initially is wealth and not political power. It's the wealth that buys them political power, which is the problem for Putin, 
um, when he does not want that political power to be independent of him. And so now what the stories are here again and again, like um, of all his bodyguards and the Zolath of him, the one who challenged Navalny to a duel, um, is the reverse, that, um, that it is political power and proximity that gets you the wealth. Now that happened under Yeltsin. There's a whole stuff about it. the family, as they call the Yeltsin family, and, and he had bodyguards who got wealthy too, but not quite as wealthy. Um, so I think I think that that is a significant change. Um, you know, what comes first, money or power? Um, and in a capital, in a, in a pseudo-capitalist system or whatever you want to call it, you expect the money to come first. Um, but I don't think the money comes first. Thank God we're the exact opposite. Yes. <laughs> hey, I'm, yeah. Sure. Um, but we are just off the Russian moment. Um, so um, then the other thing, of course, when you're when you're um, fighting against the uh, notion that it's all about Putin, you know, I completely agree with you. I'm, I'm sick of the whole thing, and I've, I've written about this extensively and screened about it. Um, and um, what I don't remember seeing in, in, in the book so far, and what you didn't mention too much right now, is um, you know how much how much we're talking about the first. Um, decade of the 21st century is simply about oil prices, right? Um, that is, um, talk about luck, right? Um, that Putin comes to power and oil is, and, and, and oil goes up and there's money available, and even with the massive corruption and the leak and the, the, um, the siphoning off of resources, there's enough to make people's lives a bit better. And that, look, you know, oil prices are dropping and people are a little less happy and the, and the regime is getting, um, is getting stricter. Um, it, from one point of view, you could be able to predict it, not that I did or anyone I know did. Um, but that's typical when it comes to um, Western analyses of Russia. Um, again, about Putin or not Putin, um, the title is great. The title, of course, comes from the slogan. I do think of, I've seen this several times before, but actually I think it was um, Nadia Tolkornikova from Pussy Riot who put it best when she was asked when, about her opinion about Putin because she referred to Putin. She said, that, I don't think about Putin um, at all. Putin is nothing. But I say Putin, but when I say Putin, I mean this entire system. Um, that he um, is in the middle of, that he represents, but it's not about him as a person. But she says she has no feelings about him as a person, which is, I think, probably an exaggeration. I mean, I have feelings about him as a person, and he didn't even put me in prison. Um, but in any case, um, so I think there, there's precedent for this, and I think there's, I think, um, teasing out Putin from the system, but also recognizing how the system has become centered around this figure is really important. Throughout the 1990s, there was all of this almost um, uh, dispensationalist um, waiting for this new kind of hardcore messiah who would come and take over from Yeltsin and have the firm hand and, and, and get the country in order. If you read some of what people were writing in the 90s, it looks like the road is being paved for, as the song puts it, someone like Putin. Um, and then he comes along and he is nobody. He is the man without a place. He, he has no characters. This is Chauncey Gardner. Um, but eventually starts, I think, to believe his own press. Um, I also really like uh, how you th this emphasis on light ideology and, and you deal with things like um, Dugin and Gumilyov, the ideologues, really well. But it does make me think that um, as you contrast this, uh, as you talk about the contrast between this notion of the evil Putin versus liberalism, um, I think it's actually, one can, if you want, you can give Putin credit for this, but I think it's actually more of a kind of very, clever um, ideological back and forth manipulation. One way of looking at it is that Putin is not there keeping out liberalism. Putin is there keeping out far right extremism. Um, because he is, uh, the funny thing is, I mean, I think America is much closer to being fascist than Russia because Putin will not let Russia become fascist. Um, that is a safeguard. That's not a praise of Putin, but it is a safeguard. He can incorporate um, virtually any piece of extreme discourse and soften it rather than actually being you know, the mouth of simply spouting Dugin or spouting Yuyi. Um, I really liked your stuff about how the legacy of the Soviet past um, helped make um, the trans make survival of the transition possible. I think the trade is a good example. Um, I just don't remember from, from reading the book. I, it would be interesting to hear more examples of how that would help the situation when you don't have a trade union helping you. Because there, there is a broader, I mean, it's a broader phenomenon of, um, of people somehow staying alive um, during all of this. Um, and then finally, you know, the, the allusion to the question, why is there not more opposition now? Um, I mean, I think one could make the argument that to some extent it has less to do with, with um, well, some of it, of course, the opposition was in disarray, could never agree on anything, and was disconnected from whoever the people are. Um, 
But you know, very effectively, starting with the, um, Putin's third, right after Putin's third term, the um, the state has shown that you know um, you very well may get imprisoned if you do things. So it really the the, the simple fact that the danger of, of publicly expressing dissatisfaction is much more real than it used to be, even if, as in, with every law in Russia, um, the implementation of the law is um, unpredictable, which is actually kind of the point, I think. Um, that phenomenon is enough to really suppress opposition until things get really, really terrible. Thanks, I see you clarify a little bit about the continuity and discontinuity of the um from the 90s and 2000s about the economic and political continuity and discontinuities. Mm -hmm. Can you repeat that part? Sure. So the economic, what I saw as the economic discontinuity is that first comes wealth, then comes power in the 90s. Um, but now, um, you know, uh, Putin did crush the independent oligarchs. I mean, I know that Oliver Stone made it sound like this wonderful class war on behalf of the people, and Putin practically burst out laughing, but the Botox saved him. Um, but, um, now it, it, it does seem to be very much reverse, the, the reverse that, that is um, wealth depends on, at least in part, the preservation of the accumulated wealth. And, and very often the accumulation of the wealth itself um, depends on um, the close relationship or the favor, or at least the lack of disapproval um, of the people in that central system. In terms of the political system, there are more continuities than I think people give um, people credit um, precisely because of the um, amount of very visible manipulation that was being done during in, in the elections and in the campaigns in the 1990s that um, America was supporting um, primarily out of fear that the communists would return. In 1996, there were four, um, I think it was 96, there were four referenda on, on um, um, about uh, the Constitution, and the slogan that you'd hear in the subway, who was paying this in the subway, was da, da, niet, da. Um, that's how you're supposed to vote. You're told wherever you go, duh. I don't remember what the questions were anymore, but I remember it was da, da, yet da. Um, I don't think you can translate that. Um, and so um, it was not this wonderful free wing democracy. It was very manipulated, um, but it didn't come, it wasn't portrayed as nearly as sinister, um, in part because it was so chaotic and, um, and because Yeltsin was, by that point, seemed like such a joke. Um, but the, the technologies that they call them in Russia, the technologies of manipulation, um, were already being built. Is that yeah, yeah, it is great. Thanks all. Um, join in. Uh, Anne O'Donnell? I just have a very small question um, to start, which is that I'm curious about the point, and of course not having read your book this feels very unfair to just be posing these questions on the basis of a short talk, mm -hmm. but I'll do it anyhow. Um, I'm curious about the point we're making about the uh, welfare infrastructure facilitating what you call a transition to capitalism. And I see the point in the sense of um, preventing perhaps even greater social collapse than existed in the 90s. I think I understand you correctly in, in, in that being the chief sort of benefit of that network. But how does that produce capitalism? How is, what is the distinction between the prevention of social collapse, or you know, yellow vests, or street demonstrations, and you know, uh, say nothing of a full market democracy, but but the economic system that we get in the early 1990s. You can uh, should I yeah whatever you like. Um, yeah, because uh, Sophie's and Elliot's points were really great, and there's a just a lot of different things I have to say about all of that, so, um, but let me, yeah, on the question of how the continuity, I guess I didn't mean that the continuity itself produces the transition of capitalism, more that it, uh, it removes obstructions that might otherwise be there, uh, so that it makes, um, I guess one example is you don't have hordes of unemployed people on the street because they are they still have a job that they go to and they just paid for it six months later. Mm -hmm. So there is a continuity of you know industrial infrastructure and theoretically of employment, but really there's no you know no one is being paid for this, no one is receiving anything, but they are given the impression that something will happen somewhere down the line. Uh, I mean, otherwise known as wage theft, but. Um, 
but you, you can imagine the degree of dislocation that would happen if these people were suddenly, you know, millions of people were suddenly out of work, and then you have a mass of people discontented who have a, a clear target of attack. So I guess part of what I'm describing is it's not it's not just the persistence, but it's the simultaneous persistence of the old with the creation of the new that sort of blurs the picture overall. Uh, I mean, the other example I think is really interesting is that in the 90s, the I think I'm right, apart from a few strikes in coal mining, up until the mid 90s, I think 91 to 96, the overwhelming majority of strikes in Russia were in the education sector. Uh, and the reason for that is that it was obvious who you should address your strike to. Whereas if the economy has been rapidly privatized, no one knew who even owned any of this stuff because it's all in shell companies in Cyprus and wherever else. So it's really to do with the, the lack of clarity in that picture. And so I guess what I'm arguing with the, with, the, with the continuity of the old is really that that helps supply one part of the blurring. If you see what I mean, I don't think that's clear. Um, and yeah, on these other points, these are all really good, good questions and, and uh, topics for discussion. Um, I, mean, I, I guess if I do all of these, it take, I have lots to say. Uh, but in a way, Sophie and, and Ellie, you both, um, in a way, pointed to the question of the relationship between the 90s and 2000s and the outsider and insider oligarchs, the, the origin of money and the connection between political power and money. I, I'd like to just read out a quote, because uh, it's one of my favorites. Uh, this banker, Piotr Aven, who was the, until recently the chairman of Alpha Bank, uh, was interviewed, I think, by David Hoffman of the Washington Post, uh, and said famously, quote, to become a millionaire in our country, it is not at all necessary to have a good head or specialized knowledge. Often, it is enough to have active support in the government, the parliament, local power structures, and law enforcement agencies. One fine day, your insignificant bank is authorized to, for example, sorry, for instance, conduct operations with budgetary funds, or quotas are generously allotted for the export of oil, timber, and gas. In other words, you are appointed a millionaire. Uh, now, the thing... Nice work. Good. Yeah. The, the context in which I'm quoting that is actually a description of how the, 90, uh, the 1990s oligarchs made their fortunes. So, um, what I want to say is that even the outsiders, in quote, I, I, I should back up and explain that these two categories that I use because they're not all mine. Uh, I borrow them from the economist Sergei Braginsky, uh, who has done a really good analysis of different oligarchs and their family origins, their backgrounds, whether they had a connection with the previous state apparatus. Um, fascinating stuff. Um, but he has this category of outsiders, meaning people with no visible uh, in, no contact with the previous state apparatus, no managerial position. Um, and insiders, on the other hand, obviously people who did have that kind of thing. Uh, the outsiders would include people like uh, Berezovsky, uh, Alexander Smolensky, some of these sort of 90s oligarchs who, the way I see it, made their fortunes essentially off the symptoms of the Soviet Union's collapse, uh, symptoms of disintegration and state weakness, uh, currency trading, export quotas, various kinds of dodgy deals on price differentials, for example. And then they use that wealth in order to purchase more assets. But the striking thing about these oligarchs is that most of their assets were not, uh, were either in banking or in media. Uh, they were often not physical assets uh, until later on. So, um, whereas the insider oligarchs uh, own, you know, a steel plant or a factory of some kind, or they own you know, an oil company. The, the key thing about these two factions of oligarchs is that in the 1990s, this gets to your point about oil prices, oil prices are historically low for most of the 90s. Uh, the country is in a deep economic collapse, production is you know, some vanishing percentage of what it used to be. So both of these oligarchs have all these assets, but in the 90s it's only the insiders who are making any money, essentially off banking. Uh, and then it's in the, the 2000s. Hmm? You mean the outsiders? Banking was the banking. outsiders. Yeah. Uh, up until the room collapse in 98. And then soon after that, the oil price starts to rise, natural resource prices start to climb in the 2000s, and at that point, the insiders are making a ton more money. So this is what I mean, that there's a, there's a shift in the relative weight of these two factions. But what I try and describe in the book is that actually both of them owe their rise to political power. Uh, so it's, it's complicated to describe the exact relationship between political power. Uh, there's a wonderful moment when 
uh, Berezovsky is interviewed after that 1996 election has been stolen. And uh, he says something that the equivalent of the General Motors probably know that what's good for capital is good for Russia. Uh, so there's, there's, I had the Russian friend describe this to me as Berezovsky must have been, you know, he really absorbed all that sort of Marxist materialist education he must have received. The idea that, you know, the bourgeoisie is the executive committee for managing the affairs of the state, uh, or rather the state is the executive committee for managing the affairs of the, of the state, of the bourgeoisie, and, you know, there it is, and there were seven of us, and we're going to do this. Um, yeah, so I think the, the relevant shifts are. The oil price is definitely a massive part of that shift, the overall economic climate changing. I think the arrival of Putin does make a difference in that he you know, lays down the new rules of the game and disciplines mainly the oligarchs who help bring him to power. That's the first rule, you've got to get rid of the kingmaker. But the, the key thing is really that there is no attack on the principle of massive private wealth as such. Uh, and no attack on particular sectors either. It's particular oligarchs who cross the line, do the wrong thing. But as a structural phenomenon, there is, you know, the, there are still oligarchs making a lot of money off media and banking. There's no sh tilt in the nature of the economy to say we will only favour industrial oligarchs. Well, you know, some of the richest oligarchs in Russia now. Uh, I forgot his name. Uh, the telecoms guy. Not a No, no, not Bexabo. Anyway, one of the top oligarchs on the Forbes listing is not an oil magnate or a metals magnate, he's a communications person. So uh, so I guess there are continuities and really these are about um, uh, yeah, shifts in influence rather than categorical differences, if you like. Uh, I'll try not to... What else was I going to say? Oh yeah, about re the role of repression. I absolutely agree that after 2011-12, the role of repression in keeping opposition muted is is crucial. That definitely, I should have I should have specified that, uh, and I do say that in the book. But um, and one of the things I actually I noticed this summer, which is just I think it tells you a great deal, is I went to one of these um, <coughs> protests organised by Navalny. It was on in early September, and it's very striking because you have quite a small active core of protest who turn up with the placards and the slogans and they're doing all of the chanting and these are mostly teenagers or people in their early 20s at most and they're the ones who are going to be first to be arrested because they're very visibly protesting but around that group of sort of small cluster of people is a much 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 larger group of bystanders some of whom are holding placards and some of whom are not and they could all credibly just be pedestrians and the minute the police appear just drop the signs and wander off and have nothing to do with it. But on the other hand, they could also be taken to be solidarizing with the demonstration if it went that way either. So I think that there's, there's really what's emerging is a kind of split between the kind of active core of protest, which is very, very small and under fierce repression, and a much larger pool of discontent, which is uh, going to be difficult to actively engage. So the, the, the thing about that that's important is that both of these things exist, and it's important to bear in mind that they do both exist. Because when something dramatic happens, when there is a real crisis, one can turn into the other quite quickly. So it's not, uh, it's really a question of thresholds rather than, uh, what's the word? Some more. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what's that? Gradualism. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Okay. I uh, thank you very much for this book. Um, and I didn't don't want to contradict or criticize you, but I would. Uh -huh. <laughs> I will. <laughs> the thing is, um, first you were mentioned the, um, social reforms and um, politi political reforms in people who. Um, they they cannot make like connections between them, but social reforms actually associated with returning to uh, socialism, mm -hmm. returning to Soviet Union because social reforms already were in place in so in Soviet Union, and uh, this disintegration of social reforms like how to connect it, how to if, and if you. Uh, if you uh, 
start to be for social reforms that you associated with people who want to return to the past. But actually, I would like to mostly to talk about that you nobody mentioned um, uh, real power, which is uh, emerged in the Russia. It's church. And for example, when when you you're talking about pussy rights, yeah. it's not Putin who put them in prison. They talked a lot of people protesting Putin. Nobody cares about them. They did it in church, and this part of society wanted them in their prison. And actually, Putin before before election, he had to be involved in this personally to get them out of jail. Nobody wanted them out of jail in the Russia, in, in Russia. And actually, Milner, um, um, not not Milner, um, uh, German, German was beaten almost to death for the uh, after exhibition Astrologia Religia, Religia Danger. So it's kind of it's a real power that that's very interesting how you connect these these. Um, um, new power in Russia with Putin. What's the relationship with this? It's my question about this. What do you think about it? Because it's what a what of the future of <laughs> in this light, in this context. What is the future of these powers and how they will connect? What what do you think about? It? Wonderful, uh, Philip. Um, uh, thank you for. Uh, Amazing presentation, and amazing comments, and I wanted to talk a little bit more about this kind of image of Putin that is being created in the West, and whether there are some risks associated with it, and mainly the idea that the West might inadvertently create the monster that they imagined. And uh, I, I work on Yugoslavia and uh, uh, former Czechoslovakia, where right the notion is that Putin is kind of align aligning some new neo-fascist coalition, um, and uh, this has led created a situation which. People who were very Russophobic throughout the 90s now actually, in response to this, do you know, put up pictures of Putin and so on. So just perhaps uh, talking about that and how this relates to the rest of uh, the transition in East Central Europe. Yeah. And there is this broader sense that we're reaching to all parts of Europe and uh, the United States also, um, and um, uh, are you spearheaded some sort of um, subversive movement here? For the right, and the, you know that general. Yeah. <laughs> Meaning, it comes from there, not here. Right, right, right. Yeah, these are all really good questions. Um, on the part of the church, I think this is a very good point. I probably don't pay enough attention to it in the book as a kind of vulgar materialist. This my great mm -hmm. flaw. Um, <laughs> one of the very interesting things I've always thought about Russia is the degree to which religiosity is expressed in behavioral, in terms of behavior and cultural markers, but not in terms of church attendance or religious practice. Uh, I think there are surveys, I don't know how reliable these surveys are, but in terms of regular church attendance, Russia is nowhere near as religious as, for example, the UK, which is not a religious country by any means. Uh, I've forgotten the exact numbers, but it's really, it's, it's quite astonishing, given the importance of orthodoxy in official discourse in the culture at large, but it doesn't translate into actually any you know, actual religious observance as far as I can see. There's more of it than there used to be, certainly, that's massively increased, especially compared to the Soviet period. But I think the interesting thing about, you know, and again, people in this room know this, and worked on it much more extensively than I have, but the <laughs> question of orthodoxy, uh, its relationship to national ideology as, a, as an expression of national ideology is linked to the apparatus of power. Uh, rather than as a, as a sort of self-standing belief system independent of power. Um, I mean, I'm not, I'm not totally convinced that the jailing of Pussy Riot was driven entirely by the church autonomously of Putin and the authorities. I think there's an extent to which, and again, this goes back to the question of oil prices, really, and the crisis, which is that since you can see very clearly after 2012 that the Kremlin adopted a much more aggressive stance towards protest and opposition, uh, but has also adopted a kind of much more nationalistic discourse. Uh, and the thing about Pussy Riot is that it's, 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 it's a total gift if you want to launch a culture war, uh, which is, I think, what they did. I mean, you know, 
not to be too conspiracy minded, apologies to Elliot, but I think <laughs> this is uh, it, one of the most striking things about the reaction to Pussy Riot, I mean, and entirely justifiably, was, was how totally disproportionate this trial, this whole process, what was done with that event, given how brief the performance was. Uh, why was this such an issue? And I think the answer is that it served a very, very clear purpose in the forging of this new ideological uh, idioverse, if you like, of Putin's third term. Um, so certainly the church has been very keenly driving this kind of uh, general climate. But I think if, if the state was not receptive to this and, and also keen on this idea, this wouldn't go anywhere. I mean, I think Orthodox priests come out with all kinds of outrageous statements, you know, on a weekly basis. My favorite one recently was, um, the pension reforms are punishment being visited on the population for the sins of the earlier generation. <laughs> Which, you know. Um, on that front also, yeah, the, the point about the, the association of any kind of social reform with a return to the past and the socialist legacy, absolutely, I think this is a real problem uh, for the Russian left, the Russian center left, whatever you want to describe it. So, you know, the, the problems that anyone using the word socialism has in the US, it is multiplied many times over in Russia. But um, you could actually have something like a socialist agenda without using the word socialism, and it would be quite popular in Russia. Um, I mean, I think it's still true that the constitution of Russia refers to it as a social state, so Tsarina Gosadarstva, which implies all kinds of things that the Russian state does not do uh, and is increasingly cutting back on. But there is this broad perception of a certain kind of social welfareism being uh, popular. That, and it drives, for example, Navalny has actually modified his positions uh, in the last year or so, his presidential platform is notably to the left of where he was three or four years before. Um, and he has done that because he's take, traveled around the country, he's talked to people in more places, uh, and he's clearly sensed that, you know, he's got, I mean, I don't personally have a very high opinion of Navalny as a, as a person or as a, as a, or of his integrity, but he's certainly not a, a dumb politician. And he's obviously understood that there is some kind of grounds for a political program, notably to the left of standard liberal recipes. Um, it's by no means radical, it's not even especially social democratic, but it would be a push in the direction of social welfare without using the word socialism at all. So that, I think that would be something to watch out for, that if figures like Navalny are feeling that, then more people will obviously feel that that's necessary. Um, on the question of, yeah, uh, Putin, the image of Putin creating the monster that people are trying to fend off, is that fair? A little bit, yeah. Yeah. yeah um, yeah, I think this certainly suits you know, the ideologues uh, a great deal in a way that if they're, they're, they're attributed with this amazing ideological reach. I mean, I think the real problem is, is assuming any kind of coherent strategic design of this uh, on Russia's part. I think that's just, I just don't see that. Um, I mean, I think certainly this is a increasingly a regime that sees itself as a conservative one, uh, broadly speaking. But on the other hand, and as Sophie mentioned, that it is ideologically very, uh, well, I use the term weightless, but if you like, it's also hollow. It's, it's a sort of echoing space where you can fit any number of different ideological motifs. So it's not really a vehicle for any kind of consistent conservative, let alone extreme nationalist agenda. I think it'll, it'll tilt wherever is. It's very pragmatic in that sense. It'll tilt whichever direction makes most sense. And currently, yeah, that kind of tilt makes more sense, but I don't expect it to last especially. And for example, you know, the moment there is uh, any kind of rapprochement with the West becomes possible, you won't see any of this stuff anymore. It'll just, I, I you know, confidently predict it'll disappear. Yeah. There, I'm sorry. I would just add that there's, also, there's a scholar named Marlene Laruel who writes interestingly mm. about the idea of Putin sort of navigating an ideological marketplace. Um, of which the church is definitely a very important actor, but she writes an interesting way, which I think connects well with your thesis about um, sort of Putin picking and choosing what he needs and sort of evaluating, you know, where his bases of support are, um, and then you know playing cards that 
um, sort of appeal to these different constituencies rather than him being sort of centrally motivated by a single ideology that he always has. And I think that that was an important factor in the whole Pussy Riot affair because his sort of bases of support were altering and I think he realized that this was a good time to give the church and its constituents a, a very big gift in some sense of this huge show trial. I mean, Nagoya probably wrote another book while we were sitting here. Too. I know, she writes a book like every, every weekend. Every weekend. <laughs> <laughs> Did you want to introduce yourself while we're in? Yes, yeah, uh, Nick Bowler, the History of Columbia. Um, I, I just finished the book and I very much enjoyed it and I wanted to ask a question about federalism, also in light of your previous work on, on Chechnya. Uh, you make some very interesting points towards the end of the book about the potential for federalism as an avenue of in, uh, new democratization or democratic counter movements to, to Putin. And I wonder uh, if you could connect that a little bit to the, the, the chapter on the opposition, because I didn't quite get a good sense of it, but my sense is that quite a lot of the opposition, both liberal and, and anti-corruption based, is strongly ethnically Russian and is not necessarily uh, very um, tolerant or, or able to, to unite uh, different ethnic differences across regions. And in that sense, weirdly, it seems that on some issues, Putin is actually uh, more conciliatory than, than some of the more hardline nationalists. Yeah. Um, and could you say a bit about that, especially given the challenge of unifying both opposition, but then it seems also uh, avoiding another kind of Chechnya, greater Russian versus uh, local separatists? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, that's the a piece of the book in, in the more kind of speculative chapter where I wonder where Russia is going. So, I mean, it may be that each of those things should have been a separate book I went and worked on later and had a bit more time to think through what I was saying. But um, I guess the thing, the thing that struck me most about Russia's federal structure is that, you know, famously Putin, well, first Yeltsin tried to rein in all of the sovereignty that had been let loose in the, in the 19, early 1990s, and Yeltsin then sort of consolidated what he called the vertical of power uh, and essentially killed off federalism as a meaningful uh, political uh, form. Uh, so it's, it's very sort of, you know, it has a federal, rather, Russia has a federal form, constitution, it's a federation, but actually it's a very centralized state in a lot of its most important operations. Um, one of the things that struck me looking at this federal system is that even though Russia has, you know, whatever it is now, 85 federal components, and many of them have the names of uh, different ethnic groups, in most of these federal subunits, the ethnic Russians are overwhelmingly the majority population. Overwhelming. Including ones that bear the name of a different ethnicity because of the nature of the imperial colonial experience. So it's actually only in a really small number of territories, and mostly very small territories, where the question of federalism is actually, I think, connected to any danger of nationalist separatism. Um, and actually, I, I made this argument more extensively in my previous book on Chechnya. I actually think it wasn't even a danger in most of those places, even in the early 90s when the moment was maximally uh, propitious for that. It was only really in Chechnya that that was likely and did happen. Um, so the, the question that led me to in, in, in this chapter of the book is uh, if federalism, it can't be that federal, the killing federalism is designed to head off ethnic separatism because that wasn't even a danger beforehand. So then what is it for? Uh, and killing federalism is essentially, I, I sort of suggest very casually in the book, that it's really about killing democracy uh, at the territorial level. The, um, so I think what has not really been tried in Russia is, as far as I'm aware, really is, and certainly not in the post-Soviet period, the genuinely democratic federal system. Uh, what you had was a somewhat chaotic dispersal of sovereignty in the early 90s and a sort of grab and privatization, a formation of local elites who seized hold of all kinds of uh, the local economy effectively and then proceeded to bargain with the center about the tax take and power. But none of that had much to do with democracy, per se, uh, or democratic control of resources or accountability. So I think um, you're absolutely right that a lot of the, uh, some of the opposition, certainly the, the sort of the right fringe of it, the monarchists, the nationalists, are not going to be um, at all positive about 
non-ethnic Russians expressing their democratic rights. Um, but I guess the question really at that point is, I don't know how to put this. Um, part of the, the ethno-national kind of resurgence from the right, I see that very much as a kind of post-imperial symptom. Um, and what's striking to me is that a lot of the, 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 the far right in, in Russia actually want the Caucasus, the North Caucasus to be independent. They're like, just get rid of it. Um, which, I mean, they fought two incredibly brutal wars to keep hold of this territory against its will. So this would be, I don't know, it would be like the British hard right saying, yeah, you know what, Northern Ireland, who cares? <laughs> And I can't quite process what that really means. Yeah, exactly. um, obviously, it would be a terrible thing if these hard right people ever got anywhere near power, so it's not a good thing. But in some ways, if, if the right to sovereignty of non-ethnic Russian peoples is part of the conversation, even if they don't then take it, it does put on the table the idea of, OK, but what are the roots of power? How local do they have to be? And what is the role of democracy in, in reconstituting the system from below rather than you know, ordering it from above? Um, and I think that is, yeah, that's an important question I think is going to play out. And it doesn't, and I think for the most part it wouldn't involve separatism, basically, that's, that's my... Well, the xenophobia of the right wing right now, I think, is, as in many other places, so much more focused on migrants mm -hmm. than it is on the local minorities. And, those mig and it's still post-imperial because a huge number of those migrants are from former Soviet countries. Um, and that, but though, I think those are the really, the, the uh, racialized, terrible other that they're fighting much more than just the non-Russians who happen to be part of the yeah. Russian state. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we've been... Go ahead. Uh, hey, uh, thank you. Um, I guess my question follows up on the demography section. Mm -hmm. um, you already mentioned something about the young people in the protest, so I would uh, probably want you to expand on if there is like a theoretical background to that, to, is there is explanatory power uh, why people who have not been really influenced by the Soviet system at all since they were all born in the 90s or even the 2000s, I guess, how are they becoming a political force, so to say, if they're legally like under age to be a part of a system of voting and all that, but still, and sort of my other question is connected to the uh, YouTube, I guess, and the significance of like, the new media and the young people getting politically active in Russia. Thank you. No, that's a really good question, too. Uh, yeah. Oh, is there another one? Yeah. Same, along the same lines? Mm -hmm. uh, no, no, no. Uh, okay, well, I'll, I'll try and be quick here. The, um, one of the most striking things about these Navalny protests, one of the slogans that they kept shouting, you people may have heard this, is um, they kept shouting lustration, lustratio. Um, and obviously, the common understanding of that term refers to post-communist purging of public officials, but they mean United Russia. So what's interesting to me about that is that there is a whole generation of people in Russia for whom United Russia is basically functionally equivalent to the Communist Party and that these people need to be held accountable for corruption and booted out of office and essentially prevented from running the country ever again. Um, and so, I mean, in a way, this, uh, this gets back to the, the thesis of the book right, where people think that as soon as Soviet legacies vanish, Russia will be a quote-unquote normal country and whatever else comes with that. But in a way, once those Soviet legacies vanish, you have a whole generation of people who are free to reject the new order on their own terms and take whatever motifs they want from beforehand. So it'll actually, my idea is that actually it could get less stable than it was before, because you have generations of people whose only experience is of Putin, of capitalism, of an increasingly precarious working life. Um, and it is very striking that these are, you know, these are people for, who have only known Putin as well. This is it's a sort of closed system as far as they're concerned. And so, you know, anyone saying, oh, but the Soviet, the Soviet Union was worse and much more oppressive is unreal to them. It doesn't make any sense. Um, and the technology also makes a difference. That's a very good point about YouTube, etc., because 
Um, I think the Putin regime very early on misunderstood the internet. I think they thought it was essentially like a newspaper, but on a screen. And I mean, not them alone, obviously a lot of other people underestimated the, the power of social media as a sort of organizing protest technology. But they were very late to try and clamp down on it and very ineffective in doing so. So there is a kind of, um, but it's also increasingly a way of people to receive news. And so the whole of official media, which is a bubble on television, uh, is, is decreasing. But the, the, the component of officially controlled news media in anyone's media diet is diminishing over time. And certainly for anyone under you know, 25 or 20, they probably hardly ever watch TV. So, yeah, I think it is partly a generational question, as you're saying demographically, that these are people who have been both uh, entirely shaped and lived under the Putin system, but who are decreasingly influenced by it. Thank you so much for the presentation. And I wanted to go back a little bit to this thing with the oil, and actually to avoid it, because what I wanted to say is that besides the money producing the industry, such as oil or steel, uh, Russia still has like a sort of a gigantically diverse economy, which includes a lot of consumer goods and uh, consumer industries. And even if these are not important, like in, uh, in terms of uh, exports or in terms of GDP, they have a social, a huge social function. And they need markets, either internal markets or external markets. And I was wondering whether you can, we can talk about like some sort of a conscious policy in this sense of either uh, besides the Eurasian Union, uh, but that might actually relate to like, the problem of social uh, peace, let's call it like peace, mm -hmm. and this quasi-geopolitical issue of finding markets or of boosting internal consumption. Um, yeah, that's a really good point. Um, one of the interesting things about this, I think, is that there's a sense in which the sanctions haven't been all bad for Russia, but it, or rather that they found a way of surviving and writing out a lot of the impact. And one of the things that's done is to encourage precisely domestic consumption, domestic producers, by the fact of making imports that much more expensive. Um, so uh, the key example here is agriculture, especially agriculture for export. I think Russia is now the second largest grain exporter in the world, behind the US but ahead of Canada. Uh, and it's got, you know, precisely on the question of looking for markets, you know, they've managed to get in in markets that previously were close to them in Egypt and you know, uh, I think, I believe they also import, export grain to Latin America now in the way they used it before. So, yeah, th these are, and these are things that are all a product of not just sanctions, but also somewhat the sort of economic difficulties associated with uh, the clash with the West. Um, I mean, the problem really that Russia has in terms of, you're right about it, it, it does have, by global standards, still a very large and relatively diverse economy, but it doesn't have, um, it's kind of in an awkward niche, right? Uh, structurally speaking, in that it, it doesn't have uh, the competitive advantage, say, of China, this massive pool of rural labor, which you can just pay nothing to, which is what they've done. Um, but it also doesn't have the, uh, the sort of really kind of high-tech, high-end, high-value manufacturing capacities of like Germany or even Holland, for example. They, you know, these really are very powerful players on that stage. So the question is really whether that intermediate status is in, is enough, and whether there are enough markets that Russia can access sideways, as it were, within that uh, niche to to do well. How that relates to the question of social peace is also not clear to me because, you know, a lot of these export strategies come with a cost, right? Uh, I mean, the oil exporting strategy came with the kind of Dutch disease type cost. Um, I'm not clear now what cost the agricultural one comes with. It, it, historically, of course, it came at tremendous, you know, human cost, right? The, you know, the famine at the end of the 19th century. Um, what was his name? Vinograd, the Friday, who said, you know, uh, we will export, we will starve, but we will still export, you know, some famous line which I'm now mangling. Um, 
think the problem is really the Vishnu what? Vishnu Gadsky. Hmm? Sorry, yes, Vishnu Gadsky. Excuse, excuse me. Um, yeah, the problem is really what. Uh, I don't really see what models there are for a country of Russia's size to pull off something like that. You know, if you're a smaller country, you can navigate that. But I think, to be honest, some of the problems Russia has with, are also the problems that countries like Brazil have, right? Like, what does Brazil do if China is not importing soy on that level? Yeah, and that, I don't know, I don't, I, I don't have an answer to that. Okay, then, on that note, we've been dancing around this whole question of what's exceptional about Russia and the current situation. I mean, so, you know, I don't know about the N word, liberalism, um, you know, is that an explanatory framework? You know, is it controversial, vague, on the other hand, we tend to fall back on it try to understand how so much of the globe has been heading in a similar direction in different ways. Um, There's not quite a question. It's an observation that many of the things we're talking about when it comes to Russia could be spoken about here as well, or in Brazil, or in France. Or, um, you know, the similar ideologies and the accompanying policies seem to produce similar political and social outcomes right across the world. And, um, you know, Russia, you know, when you look at certain basic metrics, uh, it's actually quite close to just about any other West West country. Uh, take the Gini coefficient, for example, which is identical to the American Gini coefficient. Right? I mean, done. Uh, um, maybe it's probably another conversation, because right? that's not what you're trying to do. Uh, yeah. Well, it's interesting. Yeah, it does, I mean, if they open that onto that kind of question, that's, that's really uh, productive, I think. Um, you know, not what aboutism, but <laughs> the shared concept that produces similar outcomes. In no, right. If neoliberal weren't such a problematic term, I mean, it would actually be much better than post Soviet, um, because that would encompass pretty much everything from '91 through now, and you wouldn't have to, that wouldn't be a period of time. That is really what we're talking about from the collapse of the Soviet Union and neoliberal Russia. But it just has a mm. bag, has baggage. I mean, Washington consensus. You know, really specific economic That's policy. Ironic. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, I guess the thing I would say on that is, is that you know, underneath all of the kind of animosity between Russia and the West for at the moment, that is the, the thing on which they do agree. Um, and you know, the IMF mission that was in Russia in the spring uh, le left with a glowing report, I and mean, they're delighted. And you know, the next thing the Russians do is raise the pension age. Uh, and then, you know, they've been doing austerity for years without anyone noticing, again, with the limits to assess with Putin. Right. But, but that, there is underneath all of this stuff a common agenda, which, yeah, and the question is whether it will ultimately make these countries more similar to each other, more, uh, what's the word, more uh, ideologically, politically compatible with each other, or whether that is actually the consequence of neoliberalism, you know, with its local characteristics, is to make all of these states much more uh, uh, to increase animosity between them as separate actors, right? Pension reform really does fit into your argument about the um, legacy of the Soviet state, right? I mean, that was an untouchable thing, mm -hmm. pension. And that was one of the few safety nets that was left, and, um, and look what's happened in college. Yeah. And, I mean, Putin made his name of the pension. Yeah. The original, in the 1990s. Even though economically it was clear that it was not going to be sustainable. Right. Thank you all. Thank you for coming and taking the time.